A single calf, heart beating at 120 BPM, is loaded onto a vessel that won't touch land for 20 days. Multiply that moment by 12 million. Now ask, how do we keep them alive, growing and calm? A single calf, only weeks old, steps cautiously onto a steel ramp. Beneath its hooves, the ground sways slightly. It doesn't know it yet, but this is no ordinary barn floor. This is the deck of a livestock vessel, bound for another continent. Its heartbeat is fast, quickened not just by instinct, but by the unfamiliar salt-tinged air. Multiply that tiny heartbeat by 12 million, and you begin to grasp the scale of a hidden global rhythm. Every year, more than 12 million live calves cross borders, carried on trucks, ships, and even planes. They move not as cargo, but as fragile, living investments. Each one requiring food, water, air, space, and calm under conditions far removed from pasture. It's a logistical feat with biological stakes, where the goal is not simply arrival, but safe arrival, with every heartbeat still intact. In the north of Australia, where the outback meets the ocean in endless folds of red and green, lies one of the most active live export networks on Earth. Cattle stations here, some larger than small European nations, are designed with movement in mind. It's not just about raising livestock. It's about preparing animals for departure. Indonesia, Vietnam, and the Middle East depend on Australia for hundreds of thousands of young cattle each year. The reason is not price alone. In parts of Southeast Asia, meat is often sold fresh, sometimes slaughtered the same day it's bought. Cold chain systems remain uneven and cultural preferences favor animals arriving alive. For these markets, a frozen carcass can't replace the role of a breathing animal. A calf on a truck in the Northern Territory is not just livestock. It is an essential link in another country's food system. But getting that calf from the red soil of Catherine to a feedlot in Java means navigating a complex mesh of veterinary clearance, transport schedules, and marine conditions. Thousands of kilometers away, in Ireland's rain-soaked lowlands, the rhythm is different, but the movement is the same. Each spring, as dairy cows calve, tens of thousands of bull calves are sorted for export. They're too young for local beef production, and too numerous to be absorbed by the domestic market. But across the channel in Spain, the Netherlands, and Poland, they represent the start of a growing veal supply. The process begins on small family farms, filters through livestock auctions, and funnels into tightly regulated assembly centers. These centers are a kind of holding ground, where the animals are checked, sorted, and readied. The logistics here are delicate. Calves just 10 to 20 days old have undeveloped immune systems, small stomachs, and limited tolerance for stress. A change in temperature, an unexpected weight at port, or a crowded vehicle can quickly spiral into illness. Welfare rules require breaks for rest, feed, and inspection. But the real measure of success is whether the calves arrive able to feed, stand, and grow. In Brazil, the numbers scale up. From the green hills of Paraná to the steamy roadsides of Pará, the calves headed to Egypt or Iraq pass through an immense transport web. Export volumes have grown steadily in recent years, despite global scrutiny. In some areas, paved roads end in dirt tracks that flood during the rainy season. In others, midday temperatures soar above 40 taxaks and bikes, forcing haulers to drive at night or rest in shaded yards. But the flow doesn't stop. In importing nations, live animals bring more than meat. They support feed production, training for veterinarians, and in many cases, form the backbone of national breeding programs. An air-conditioned jet may fly elite genetics to a distant country, but for mass-scale meat production, it's the slow, steady movement of young animals that fuels growth. At the center of this system lies a simple question. How do you move millions of calves without losing their health or their value? Grain doesn't get heat stroke. Crates of lettuce don't panic in loud noises. Calves do. They need space to lie down. They need water every few hours. They must be protected from their own instinct to huddle or scramble. Transporting them is not a matter of simply moving bodies. 
It's about responding to needs that change minute by minute. This is where precision begins to replace brute strength. Specialized trucks use shock-absorbing floors and insulated walls. Trained handlers monitor the calves for signs of stress, pinned ears, heavy breathing, lameness. Transport planners coordinate routes to minimize rough roads, long waits, or heat exposure. At sea, the livestock vessels themselves are floating barns. Multi-deck structures with feeding systems, air circulation, and non-stop surveillance. Feed is stored in tons. Water is pumped through filtered systems. In the middle of the ocean, hundreds of calves might be eating quietly, unaware that the world is shifting beneath them. But make no mistake, the system is fragile. A delay at port, an outbreak of disease, a change in trade policy, and thousands of animals can be stuck in limbo. For handlers, every decision carries weight. Too much density, and calves fall sick. Too little and space becomes inefficient. And the entire process is watched by regulators, by markets, and by critics. Animal welfare groups continue to pressure governments to tighten standards or ban the trade entirely. Scandals over neglect or overcrowding can lead to suspension of licenses or even national bans. That scrutiny has driven improvements, but it also adds another layer of tension to every move even so, calves continue to be raised, tagged, inspected, and loaded. From remote outback yards to humid ports on the Mediterranean, the same quiet moment repeats itself. A young animal stands at the edge of a ram, hesitant but steady. On the other side lies another pasture, another feedlot, another market. And somehow, through weather, time zones, and kilometers of asphalt and ocean, more than 12 million of them cross those invisible lines each year. Not frozen, not packed in crates, but alive, alert, and still growing. Inside the livestock vessel, the air hums with low mechanical rhythm. Fans turning, pumps shifting water, engines thudding below deck. Calves, just a few months old, are penned in groups, standing on layers of absorbent sawdust designed to minimize slips and pressure on their joints. Every few minutes, a soft mist drifts through the ventilation system, cooling the decks and keeping temperatures within strict margins. Above them, feed is dispensed from silos that carry tens of thousands of kilograms, funneled down to troughs in timed portions. Water is drawn from desalination tanks, filtered and piped to every level of the ship. At sea, these animals are not passengers. They are moving organisms inside a system that never sleeps. It feeds, waters, cools, and monitors them with quiet precision. Before any of this movement takes place, preparation on land unfolds like a tightly scripted rehearsal. In Australia, calves are held in export yards for weeks under observation. They are weighed tagged, vaccinated, and examined. Every animal must meet health standards that reflect not only domestic rules, but also the importing country S requirements. Trucking them from inland stations to coastal ports is done with care. The vehicles are specially fitted with ventilation slots, shock-absorbing floors, and dividing gates to reduce crowding. Drivers are licensed in livestock transport and trained to respond to changes in animal behavior restlessness, heavy breathing, or refusal to stand. On certain routes, haulers move at night to avoid the worst heat. On others, shaded rest pens along the way allow calves to recover. If one calf begins to falter, it can be removed, treated, and replaced before export. In these moments, logistics becomes a form of husbandry. Across Europe, movement is shaped by regulation and infrastructure. Irish calves bound for continental veal farms are typically less than three weeks old, delicate and highly sensitive to disruption. Their transport runs through a network of assembly centers where temperatures are checked, vehicles inspected, and paperwork cleared. Every movement is monitored, real-time temperature tracking, GPS location updates, even video feeds from inside trailers. At sea, during the ferry crossings from Ireland to France, crews monitor motion effects carefully, adjusting for wind and wave to avoid stacking stress. On arrival, the calves are unloaded into designated resting stations before continuing overland. 
Small errors, overloading, excessive noise, a steep ramp can set off a chain reaction of illness. That S. Why each part of the process is layered with redundancies and reviewed after every export cycle. In Brazil, live export stretches across immense terrain. Calves are moved from ranches in the interior to ports where ships wait with open hatches and feeding silos. Roads here can change from asphalt to dust in a matter of kilometers, and sudden rains can turn dirt tracks into mudfields. To avoid disruption, exporters have built shaded holding yards near port zones. Here, animals are rehydrated, rested, and calmed before boarding. Vets conduct final checks in early morning hours, reading ear tags and checking temperatures. Once cleared, the calves are herded slowly up wide. Non-slip ramps designed to reduce hesitation. A single slip or surge can lead to injury, so every element is built for smoothness, curved fencing, quiet handling, minimal electric prods. Technology continues to reshape how these animals are moved. Some ships now include infrared cameras and environmental sensors that detect even subtle changes in heat or moisture. On land, wearable trackers are being tested to monitor heart rate and muscle tension. If a calf begins to show distress, the system alerts handlers before symptoms escalate. In feedlots, unloading platforms are padded and angled to reduce joint strain. Some ports have even tested scent-based calming systems, low-level essential oils, released during loading to reduce anxiety. Still, things go wrong. In rare cases, delays due to political disputes or mechanical failure leave animals stuck in limbo. The most visible failures draw headlines. Ships stranded at sea, border rejections, or unacceptable welfare breaches. These cases prompt scrutiny, reform, and sometimes suspension of entire export lines. But most shipments continue quietly. One after another, calves are delivered to new landscapes, some for feedlots, some for breeding, some for fresh meat markets. In Indonesia, the unloading process is swift. Workers trained in low-stress handling use soft barriers and curved lanes to lead the animals off the vessel. Feed and shade are waiting, along with weeks of veterinary oversight. Air transport plays a far smaller role, but it represents the high end of the trade. Calves flown for genetics or elite breeding are placed in custom-designed crates and loaded into pressurized, temperature-controlled cargo holds. Every phase is timed. Feeding is calculated to avoid digestive upset. Flights are short, costs are high, and risks are tightly managed. In all of this, one truth remains. Calves are moved not like boxes or containers, but as living beings with fragile needs. They respond to heat, to sound, to waiting. They require careful timing and constant watchfulness. And so, from the weight of feed on a ship at S deck to the angle of a truck, S ramp, every detail is tuned for one outcome, keeping them alive, upright, and steady as they move between worlds. In Jakarta, Cairo, and coastal Vietnam, calves raised thousands of kilometers away graze under unfamiliar skies, some will be sold fresh at local markets. Others will contribute to breeding programs designed to reshape national herds. Their presence ripples outward through feed suppliers, veterinary clinics, transport networks, and kitchens. A single shipment can sustain hundreds of jobs and influence animal health practices across a region. These calves do not merely arrive, they integrate. In Indonesia, Imports from Australia have refined entire systems. Workers now recognize early signs of heat stress, adjust feed blends, and manage animals using low-stress handling learned from Australian models. In North Africa, imported calves support smallholder breeders and religious markets where fresh, locally slaughtered meat is essential. These animals are not products, but participants in food systems that value presence and process as much as outcome. At the same time, scrutiny of the trade has deepened. Footage of mishandled animals or extended voyages has forced companies and governments to raise standards. Independent observers monitor conditions on vessels. Mortality rates are tracked, logged, and published. In some countries, 
live export has been curtailed altogether. But elsewhere, investment has poured into cooling systems, better bedding, and health sensors that detect distress in real time. Even manure and bedding waste are being converted into biogas and compost, feeding the very regions that receive the calves. Still, the work is not seamless. Delays happen, ports close, weather shifts. But amid these disruptions, the trade holds, because it is watched, adjusted, and anchored by people whose livelihoods depend on its stability. And so, calves continue to move. They are raised in one climate and fed in another, carried across borders with care measured in millimeters. Their motion reflects more than commerce. It reflects coordination, necessity, and the quiet commitment to move life without breaking it. Each calf that crosses a border alive carries more than weight. It carries the work of hands, machines, and choices made in silence. From ports to pastures, the system holds because it listens. So next time you see fresh meat in a market, far from where the animal was born, remember, it got there breathing, standing, and fed, because someone made sure it could.